Good evening and a very warm welcome to you. Welcome to another episode of Designing Cities for All. Designing Cities for All is our two-year-long research and activity program in which we take a deep dive into, into designing products, places and systems for all. This uh, live cast is the final part of a triptych and we investigated the identity of cities called identity and this triptych has been co-curated by Liongo Juliana, who joins me here. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you. We nice have had a focus on uh, humans and uh, their identities, and we focused on how you can design a space that fits the human skill and f f makes every person feel welcome in a city. Um, in a moment, Leongo, I would like to see what your takeaway is from the previous episodes. But before I do that, I would like to focus on another thing. If you would join into in our, if you'd like to join into our conversation, that is possible. Please do go to the program page on pakhuiserswerger.nl, and there you can log into Zoom. In Zoom, you've got two options, the chat function where you can talk amongst each other and the program maker of Pakhuizen Zwijger. And through the Q&A function, you can ask a question to the people who are joined in the conversation here. Make sure you mention who your question is geared to so I can get the right question to the right person. Well, back to business. Um, previous episodes, um, what is the main takeaway that you had well, at the, at, the, at the end, I had a conclusion that, you know, we as architects in our training, we are not trained enough in observing and understanding the human behavior. Mm. So that, that part of our training should be uh, enriched, it should be better, um, to be able to understand um, how human beings behave, what, what, what their needs are, and design from that point of view. I mean, our design... Uh, education is too much catered towards creating these uh, iconic buildings instead of understanding what are the questions uh, that society is asking us. So that was an important uh, part. I mean, of course, it was confirmed by um, uh, Maurice Kroll that we are, live in these super diverse cities and that we have to design for people. So then you have to know all the, the, the city in all its diversity and how, how do you go about that. So that was one of the takeaways of, of uh, last time. Can I add something to that? Because, yeah. because we live in super diverse cities yeah. where there is no one majority, one, not one dominant majority anymore. It means you have to really know who you're designing for. But as an architect, I understand as well that you cannot cater to everybody. No. So what is the process of decision making so you can take as many views as possible into account? Yeah, well, it's, it's what, what is the challenge that we have now that is that it's a big group that is not taken into account at all mm. uh, because of the bubble that the majority of the architects and planners uh, live in. And they don't, know, they don't realize that there is a, such a big group of people with a different, maybe that do certain things differently that they don't cater towards. You can never cater to everyone, but mm. you should have a feeling for the majority so that the majority of the people have a sense of belonging no, in, the, in the city. That, that's the opposite because I just learned in these two previous episodes that the majority is not the most important. No, but you have, <laughs> you, you have it's, it's not that the majority is the most important, but that you have to know about ma the majority of the people. So not as a majority, as a, as a, as a average, yeah. but you have to know the, the, the extremes also. So you have to know a big group of people to be able to, to deal with um, the question you have to, to answer to the city. You have so, to take a wider palette. Yeah, of, so it's of not about the average. It's, it's about it's about knowing, knowing the extremes and how do you cater for those, and that a big group feels has that feeling of belonging. Right. Uh, this episode, what are we going to talk about? Well, th this ap episode we're gonna we, we're gonna talk about um, the identity of of the of the creator of the designer, but it, it, we're gonna go broader because we're also gonna go to music again. So I want to see, you know, how does our, how does the identity of the creator uh, uh, influence the work he makes, and then on the other hand, how does his work influence the identity of of the people 
And, and that, that is, let's say, the first part we will be talking about the identities of, of our guest, and I guess um, I have to talk about mine also. And um, in the second part, we will, we will see how, this, how you use this to uh, um, create spaces that has, have an influence on the identity of people, because architecture has that, that capacity to, 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 let's say, form be people. Yeah, and uh, identity is very important, and especially when you take the identity of the designer in account. Uh, you very briefly mentioned music as well. Yeah. Um, we involved music in the previous episode as well. Um, yeah. Why did you do that? Well, in the previous previous episode, I learned that uh, that architecture is the solid form of music. I, I, I didn't know that quote. That's a quote. But There's a I, very interesting quote. We have that on screen yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, if architecture is frozen music, then urban planning is composition and placemaking is improvisational street performance. That's a brilliant quote, of course. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Charlotte uh, uh, shared that quote with us in the previous episode. Why does that? Um, why do you, can you make a connection to that statement? Well, it, it actually uh, started when I when I was studying, and I was trying to find this contemporary Caribbean architecture where you don't have many books about that. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, where can I find other art forms that? People, a lot of people know, and that have that that they have this connotation Caribbean with, and then I I, I reach to music. I'm, I'm not, you know, I cannot. I can turn on a radio. That's basically my skills in music. But <laughs> I can listen. Um, and in the music, I found what I was looking for in my architecture, that it being clearly contemporary and also sh having the roots. And, and that's what I want to show today with, with Isaline, um, where she, um, she has been able to make contemporary music with clearly uh, Caribbean Curacilinian roots. Yeah, right. Isolin Callista, who is here as a guest as well, yeah. uh, we will talk to her later okay. and we will listen to her perform as well, which I'm very much looking forward. Uh, Charlotte Schans was the one who shared the quote with us yeah. and I'm very happy that she did in the previous episode. Um, we would like to start with our first round of discussions or our talk and I would like to introduce two guests to you. Um, Anna Machkic, she is an architect and co-founder of Studio LA. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Very nice to be here. Um, if I would confront you with a statement, um, if you take your identity and your background into design, um, isn't that very, that is, because it's a statement I have to formulate it differently, that is very limiting. What would you say to that? Um, whew, difficult question. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think for me... My identity and my history uh, helps me to uh, to understand the world in a better way, um, and I think that with under trying to understand that, I can also add something to this uh, yeah architecture field, mm -hmm. um, which maybe others cannot because they don't have my history, they don't have my background, um, and I think that's the beautiful thing of a diverse society that everyone can add something from out of their own experience. Right. And we will talk about that more later. Uh, but I would like to introduce our second guest as well, who will join us through Zoom. Um, Ali Manjera is an architect, a co-founder of Manjera Iver Architects. Ali, are you there? Hello. Hi. Very well, a warm, very warm welcome to you. You're based in London. You're currently in London as well. Yes, I'm in London at the moment. I would like to confront you with a statement as well. Um, when a designer uses this identity as, as a starting point for um, his designs and as an endpoint almost as well, uh, in, that se in that way he excludes people in his design. What would your opinion be about that? I think it's the reverse. I think, well, in my, in, I can only speak about myself, but if you have a kind of a, an identity or your upbringing is, let's say, diverse, and, and you've got different points of view, I think you can be much more inclusive. And I think that's, I mean, that's the kind of thing, I mean, my, my parents are South African, let's say. So I think it also depends on the politics of your upbringing. So if you're, I was aware as a child of apartheid, for example. So I was aware of, of many issues about gender, about race, about um, where you can live or where you can't live, um, only because of my parents telling me stories of apartheid. So. I think it's it's it just gives you an awareness and um, maybe um, a sensitivity to um, include more people than otherwise you, you know 
with a very narrow education, you might not be able to do that. Right. Um, Leongo, is there anything you would like to know? Yeah, well, there's, there's many things I would like to know about bo both my guests, but um, to, to continue on, on, on the topic that, that Ali touched upon. Um, we, in a previous discussion, we have talked about being insiders and outsiders at the same time. Um, um, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that, Ali? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it, it's actually a quite a privileged position to be in. I feel, um, I, in a sense, I feel um, on a higher level. Um, you, for example, you know, uh, the UK public, I suppose the Dutch public, uh, are given a certain world perspective, a certain worldview. I automatically look at the other side of, 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 you know, of what's been presented on the news, in the media, and, and I automatically question what I've been told. And I think um, the vast majority of people don't have that. And, and I think um, that gives you this uh, incredible ability to, to both be plugged in, to be an insider, to be part of the establishment, so to speak, but also to, to give a, a different insight and, and to see it always from the point of view of someone else. And I think I think that's a really useful. Um, it's useful for what we do, but I think it's a really useful insight. And, and Aina, can you can you can you elaborate on the same? How do you experience that? Um, yeah, I kind of do agree with Ali, but at the same time, I don't kind of want to say I'm an insider or an outsider because in some ways I really f feel an outsider in Dutch society, but in some ways an insider. So it really depends on on the situation. Uh, so now last week with, with, of course, the elections, I felt like an outsider completely. So, um, yeah, but I think it's definitely because if you have, if you're raised in a, if you're, if you're bicultural, of course, you have in certain ways, you, you are an insider in, in certain things, but an outsider in others. So I think, yeah. 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 I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I, I know that feeling. I think Ali refers to the same. It's that you can feel so much part of, of, of a group and then suddenly not anymore because some small thing that, that, that happens and then you suddenly feel that you are the stranger. Yes, and it's, it's very it, unpredictable. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's not, you're not being able to put in a, in a silo. Right. Uh, Ali, there, there's a question I would like to ask you as well. Um, uh, what part does religion play in design or should faith be part of designing as well because um, there's a lot of people who think those threats should be separated what is your opinion on that well I mean we've done um, we've done a fair number of religious buildings I mean from churches to kind of um, you know um, mosque and all kinds of you know religious buildings in different parts of the world um, including in Spain and Middle East I think um, religion is interesting because it's a, a touch point. You know, a lot of people use religion for whatever purposes, for um, um, power or for, for, for um, um, forming, a, let's say, a tribe in a sense. It's very tribal, of course, but it, it's a good insight into a culture. And I think um, obviously the world is changing. Um, you know, the, the West is becoming less religious in a way. But I think um, religion does... Kind of touch people, so I, for for us, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting way to get into a culture and to kind of um, question uh, some of the assumptions that that culture makes about themselves. Uh, using religion is it's something you can immediately engage with people at different levels, uh, and I think that that's quite fascinating for us. Hmm. What is your opinion, Leongo? Do you do you what part should religion play in design or in architecture? Well, I, I think I think it's it, it, it's one of the it, it's very interesting building, you know, it's architecture because you have to plunge into that religion to understand the the, the feeling, the emotions that 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 are there. Um, a lot of our um, because because of the places of worship being mostly bigger buildings, stronger buildings, those are the buildings that we still have to look on. So in our education as, as an architect, um, religious buildings have play a very important role, even though it's very focused towards the West. Uh, and, but I will get back to that with Ali later. Um, and um, so in, in that sense, yes, indeed, a religion can tell you a lot about a culture. But um, I think the, the interesting part is, is when, when maybe certain aspects of that religion 
conflict with your principles as an architect and what do how do you go about that because that is the interesting part and you know the the difficulty about um, discussion about religion is that a lot of a lot of um, uh, items that are placed into religion are actually uh, things that are culturally and has not uh, have very little to do with the actual religion um, if you look at it in a pure, more pure um, way uh, and and that is the, the the challenge that we deal with and uh, it, it's a it's a pity that um, religion in the West and and a specific for instance uh, the Islamic religion has such a negative connotation um, even though that it's it, it's so it's such a rich uh, a religion from which uh, you we we use examples out of it. It's part of our daily life, but we don't seem to acknowledge or want to acknowledge that. And it, it, for that matter, it's, it's the same as, as for instance, um, um, parts of our culture that have a descent from uh, uh, our colonial past um, that we also don't want to acknowledge in this country. You know, so it's not about pointing fingers. It's about knowing how broad your 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 background is as a Dutch society, and you you know the more more I explore about other cultures, other religions, is the more uh, uh, ingredients I have to, to, to make the architecture uh, and to answer the questions I get from society, to answer the, the, the questions, you know? So um, for me, it's always enriching to, to, to get to know more about others. Right. And Anna, you, you're not in agreement. What do you agree with in, in, that, in this regard? Um, exactly uh, the thing Leongo ended with so that it's knowing more about the other is an, is a huge enrichment for your practice and it's also a responsibility you have as an architect to because you're part of society so mm. you're a citizen and you're an architect uh, both so you have to know uh, your clients your users and and it's also in your designs meeting creating spaces where people can meet that can be uh, enhanced by religion as well, uh, is important as well. Why are those meeting places so important in what you design? Um, because I think meeting places are places where you can meet um, someone you wouldn't meet um, in, in your daily life, the routine you normally have. Um, so you can really have surprising encounters. Uh, but uh, we, we mostly also design places where people can speak with each other. So really, uh, uh, yeah, places where people can have a conversation and that conversation is programmed. And we really believe that the setting and the space that you are in inf also influences the conversation uh, you have. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, well, actually, you know, this is exactly what I miss in this Corona time is, is this, you know, meeting people that I didn't expect to meet. You know, I go to meetings and I know who am I going to meet. OK, I always learn from other people. But, you know, it's it's that that is the trick, I think, with with architecture is to be able to facilitate that people meet each other, because the moment you meet each other, you uh, you can get. Uh, a certain desire to get to know the other if you don't meet or if you meet in a forceful way because that's all that's on the other end you you also lose interest into in the next but for instance take the former metro that we had here in the netherlands where you were sitting opposite each other in this small space and your knees were nearly touching each other all you were doing was trying to look away and not get in contact now you have a little bit more distance so maybe you can get in contact with each other it's the same on a corridor if the corridor is too narrow you try to avoid the other. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's about creating places uh, that people can meet. In, in, yeah, in, yeah. yeah in, in, in that sense, um, um, where, where people can meet as well, and that's the strange experience that we have in these corona times as well. Um, what I wondered about is, um, Ali told us about his parents who are from South Africa, which made him very critical and a critical thinker uh, in regard to what you see in mass media, for example. In the introduction, you said you had to involve your own origins as well. Being from Curacao, what is, how does that influence you as an as a, as a architect? I, I think, I think um, one, something that happened this afternoon again is uh, in the Netherlands, it has to be either or. And Growing up in Curacao, it can be both. 
<laughs> you know, it, it, you know to refer back to food in Curacao. When you go to the to the Chinese, you don't have to choose between rice and potatoes. You can have half and half. And um, you know, it's it's. It, and I, I am not the one or the other. And mixing um, in, in Curacao comes very natural. Mm. And I think that that really forms my 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 identity as a person, and and also as a as an architect. Yeah. Are you in short telling me that you could want to have it both ways? Yes, I I want to <laughs> eat from both uh, plates. <laughs> that's that's how it is. And I I'll be Dutch when it you know when it's convenient, and I'll be Curacaoian when it's convenient. So I can I can switch between both of them. Right, uh, Anna, and what? regard as your background. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and can you explain how that is important to you as a designer as well? Yes, well, I'm born in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, it was a country that uh, was part of Yugoslavia. Um, and um, in 92, 93, the war broke out there. So um, we fled to the Netherlands and um, yeah, actually two weeks after we came here, I celebrated my fifth birthday. Um, so, and we were actually, you could say, ethnically cleansed there because we were, we have an uh, Islamic background. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we weren't welcome anymore as uh, as a group. Um, um, so when I went back to Bosnia many summers after, um, I saw a destroyed city, the city where I'm from, um, and also where architecture is being used to segregate people again. Um, so that impacted me as a teenager, as a kid, ve very much. And I really saw what a, what is at stake if we live in a segregated society and where your name, your uh, background, your religion is, um, yeah, is yeah, is is influencing your future. Um, so. That's actually why I wanted to do something with with architecture because I wanted to yeah know if yeah I wanted to research if it's possible to make places that do connect people again. Right, and and use the power of architecture as yeah. well. I, I have one question in in this phase that I really want to ask you. You know, because for a long time in the Netherlands, integration assimilation was believed to be the key to success for someone with a migration background. And you are clearly, um, as I, I got to know you, clearly refer to your Bosnian background and use that as an asset. And, and where, where did you do that, you know, very consciously or, or that's just your, the, the way you are? I, I would like to know how, how did you go about this? Yeah, I think it was for many years it was the opposite. And I think I was also a bit raised in that way in the Netherlands that I always had to, my parents always told me like you, you have to be better than than the rest um, because yeah you are a foreigner we are foreigners so you have to succeed um, so that's what I and also my first day in in high school I realized because I um, I realized I was I was talking Dutch in a wrong way so I, I I said words completely differently and it was a very wide school so people so kids started to tease me kind of like you know I was talking in a wrong way so I learned all these words like by heart too. I've really studied uh, and I start straightening my hair and I really wanted to look different. Um, and then I came to Amsterdam when I was 17 and that changed me completely because, um, yeah, I think this city kind of showed me that you could also be, yeah, you could also try to be yourself, you mm. know, and figure out who are you <laughs> uh, as a teenager or someone in your 20s. Um, and uh, yeah, when I did my first, I got I got a grant when, when I was like 24, I think, to do research on uh, monuments and architecture in Bosnia. And then I realized how uh, rich this research is and how much I can learn from it. And at that moment, I kind of also realized, uh, yeah, it's, it's okay to be, uh, you know, Bosnian-Dutch, Dutch-Bosnian or whatever, just be both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can we ask Ali the same question? Because I'm very curious how he positions himself. Yeah, I mean, if you go, go back one step, if you, we were talking earlier about religious buildings. So <laughs> another thing is that, I mean, in, in terms of inclusivity, we are having my experience, I'm quite kind of focused on bringing people together because mm -hmm having grown up and heard all the stories from my family who come over to the UK, um, you know, uh, people were divided unnecessarily because of race, because of, you know, all these other kind of issues. So 
we kind of consciously work to bring people together. So if you take religious buildings, for example, um, we try to make them open, we try to make them porous, we try to create spaces where different faiths can meet within the same um, building. And one of the one of the big problems with, with religious buildings in particular is that they, they become very exclusive clubs, uh, very tribal. So, you know, you, if, you're a church, if you go to a church, you're Christian. You know, if you go to a mosque, you're a Muslim. I think this is a real problem. And what we need to do actually is, is when you actually have, even if you're, um, let's say, uh, a separatist or, an, you know, you believe in your own faith or your own race, or if you come together with someone who is fundamentally different to you, and maybe you're sitting down and you're having a coffee with them, you'll find that, that you have certain things in common and you can't actually be that rude to them and they can't be rude to you. And over time, that brings an understanding between people. So I, I think um, my upbringing and what I've seen and what I've been taught and what I've learned myself is always about trying to bring people together, trying to find the connections between people and, and not the differences. And I think we try to do that in our architecture. We try to make it porous, open and accessible rather than to to create um, um, barriers. I think the Pope was saying recently as well, um, you know, let's, build, let's build bridges and not walls. And, and that's one of the things that I think we should try to do as architects to, to, to build bridges, see how our buildings can, can engage. And, and, and over time, you know, architecture is very kind of cellular. It's not part of the whole kind of mainstream, but over time you can influence people and you, know, you can create a setting where, where mentalities can change. I think, I think this, is, this is important because if you, I don't know how it is in Holland, but if, if you, um, as, a, as a, let's say, as a, as a Christian, and you're walking in Holland and you see a mosque, you see this building and you think, I'm not going in there. You know, these people are, there's a minaret there that I don't like because it's not part of my faith. There's this dome thing, which is, you know, not very interesting and it's not for me, but um, that's the problem. If the architecture then becomes a representation, a symbol of all the things you despise, and and it's actually happening already. If you if you look at in you know, Austria or other places, Switzerland, they ban minarets. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, that that happens here as well. There's quite an opposition against mosques and against minarets. But what is the the, the two things I want to know very shortly is. Do you know what the solution is in order to 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 to, to fence that barrier? But also, on the other hand, when Nyong'o talked about assimilation, is that something that you recognize as well? But first, the first topic, how do you bridge that gap between different buildings and, um, you know, using buildings to separate people? In a, in, a, in a very simple sense, you know, you would create spaces where um, people of different faiths can meet or people of no faith can meet, you know, within the context of, let's say, a, a Christian church or, or a mosque or whatever that is. So, so you, you set out, you educate the client, you say, listen, this is a good idea. Why don't you create a multi-phase space within your building? Because that will bring people together. And we're already doing that in one of our projects in London. And the client's really, really happy. You know, we've got, it's a kind of a religious building with a kind of an Islamic kind of um, uh, funding, funding partner. But, you know, it's been supported by the Jewish community. It's been supported by the Hindu community. And... Also, this building here that you see behind you—it's it's been supported by different faith groups. And idea is that you can really sit down and 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 you know um, discuss and 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 maybe even um, argue, but over a cup of tea, and you start to begin. But you start to understand people. I think that's really really vital. Would it be possible to place a minaret on the building behind us? We deliberately on that building. We we deliberately set out not to produce uh, to do a minaret. Why? Because we thought it would be a uh, it would be perceived in the wrong way. But If I if I turn that argument around and say, okay, what if that minaret was a wind turbine, you know, that that generated energy and did a lots of other different things that you know provided some other benefit that we could, <laughs> we we don't see right now, but it, you, you turn turn a symbol that. Oh, in that sense, that wouldn't work in, in, in Amsterdam because wind turbines in Amsterdam are a very hot topic. So I would yeah. <laughs> stay away from that. But that's a whole other discussion. Sure. Um, my final question to you before we go to our second phase of the, of the conversation is, if you, if you talk about uh, what Leongo said about integration, how do you perceive yourself as an architect? And in what, do, you, do you recognize the statement that Leongo made about assimilation being better or what Anna said that you had to work twice as hard is that something that you recognize oh, I'm recognizing both of what you're saying I mean you have to work twice as hard that's a that's a kind of a phenomenon of immigrant communities in around the world regardless of you know whether you're 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 Korean and you're living in America you have to work twice as hard 
even to get acknowledged, even to get that first step on the ladder. And I think, you know, of course that's been an issue and I'm sure it's an issue for all of us sitting here, but I think it's not so much as assimilation. I think it's a two-way process because the host community, inverted commas, should also accommodate, should also learn from us because actually um, we have a lot to give and, and, and it's not just we need to become like the host community, but the host community can learn things that we've, you know, we know that are quite individual to us that can enrich society as a whole. I mean, it, on a simple level, London, for example, now UK, one of the most popular dishes to eat is a curry. And this is interesting because actually, you know, English food is actually no longer, it's no, no longer perceived as roast beef, but as, you know, as other, other things, I think. Right. Um, I would like to return to you in the second round of the conversation as well. And I would like to include the question there, uh, how long can you perceive the country that you're in as a host country? And when does it become yours? And how does that hierarchy work? That's something that I would like to talk about a little bit later. But I'd like to invite our third guest here on stage as well. She's a very well known as a singer and a theatre maker and her body of work is impressive. Um, and in her work she merges all different kinds of cultures together and with her work as a singer but also as a teacher and a theatre performer and maker she can well almost de define a new vocabulary where it's a combination of all disciplines all cultures and all different kinds of music styles. A very warm welcome to you, Iselin Kalista. Thank you very much. It's very a pleasure nice. to be here among all these very bright, creative people. <laughs> We're very happy to that you join us as a very bright, creative person as well. <laughs> Thank you. Eli Yongo, uh, Iselin is here because you invited her. Can yeah. you please um, tell us why you invited her and ask what you want to ask to know more about her. But you already do know each other, right? Yes, we know each other for a very long time. Um, actually, I, I had the privilege to spend one year in the same primary school as, uh, as Iseline. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, in, in uh, our parents, my, my mother and her father were colleagues uh, at the housing uh, foundation of Curacao. So there are many links uh, yeah. um, and, and even up to today. So that, that's, that's wonderful to have you here. And, and on a Excuse me, is this just another version of the old boys' network? You know, your parents met you, sp spent time it's in school as well. It's a very small island. <laughs> That's how it goes. It's a very <laughs> small island. And, and, I thought we were breaking the mold, now no, we're creating and, the same mold as well. Iselin is here because she is the best singer of Curacao. I do that, agree that with I that. Know. I do agree with that. Okay. And and so that's that's why she's here. And besides that, we know each other for a very, very long time. <laughs> and I, I, I like to share this uh, this moment also here with her. And and yeah, there's many things, you know, going back to that time uh, primary school you were part of Perlitas. Um, and I was wondering if uh, how, how does that, that experience was for you? Did you have that experimental part of you already present at, at that early age? Yeah, maybe I should explain. Perlitas is like <laughs> yeah, uh, here in Holland, it's like Kinderen for Kinderen. It's uh -huh. like a very well-known ch children's choir, it was. And the songs became hits on the radio and we were doing television shows and stuff like that. And I was seven when I was in there. And um, it was a very nice experience for me because I always was singing and my mother thought maybe she should do something with it. And so we were rehearsing every Sunday and experimenting with music, learning. And I think that's where, for me, it started because we were singing traditional Curacao music, but also Latin American music. So then already, for me, my education started about the rhythms that were typical from Curacao and the rhythms that were typical from the Caribbean and the rhythms that were typical from Latin America. I, then I already started to understand the differences and what brought it together. So um, it changed my musical uh, taste forever. So I never listened really to pop radio because I was totally obsessed with everything that came from Curacao. I, I via this, this children's choir, I learned about the the classical music from Curacao uh, with, with European influences. And I, was, I thought it was so special. 
And we also got like history lessons, you know. Um, uh, Rudy Plata, who's a great songwriter from Curacao, he would write uh, songs and tell us about where these rhythms come from and uh, how come it sounds like this and why do we use these instruments. So it was a very rich education which I got uh, uh, playfully. And, but, but because as a, a little bit, we, we are a little bit artists also as architects and once that tornado of creation you know, starts within you, it's very difficult to stop it. But then you studied business administration. Yeah. How did you deal with all that desire to create music while studying business administration? The funny thing is that I was like a sponge when I was a, a child, taking it all in, and then I did nothing with it. Um, for a while, I didn't want to do... I, when I got in my 13, 14, I got very shy. I didn't want to be on stage, I didn't, didn't want to do anything. And it's like it stayed there, festing, I don't know. I went and I studied business and it was no problem. At the end of my business studies, it started to, I was like, I, I don't want to be a manager. I, I have to do something with this music thing. And then the, the creating part started. So it started very late, okay. so all stayed somewhere in my body and in my head and it, it, it yeah. grew and I fed it sometimes but it didn't want to come out till later after I studied first business then music at the end of my music uh, studies then I started wanting to create so it's it's weird but I'm it's, it's yeah, I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize but that. But that's how it that's how it went. <laughs> but but um, um, I, I think it was in, in in your studies already. You started to sing in Papiamento, or not? Yes. Yes. I started to sing in Papiamento. Yes. And 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 how did how did your professors react on that? Um, to the, they didn't really know because I was I just did what they wanted me to do in school. Uh -huh. well, where did you go to school? I studied uh, um, in Groningen at the Conservatory, Prince Claus Conservatorium, and um, I started with jazz. But I was like, these songs are not for me. And then I um, I heard Brazilian music, and that was my first love. So I thought, if I do Brazilian music. I'm happy, they're happy, everybody's happy. So, and I learned so much from this music and I love it still so much. And after a while, when I finished actually, I started writing in Papiamento. But I, I will tell you, my first English song I heard, I listened to in my life, I was 18. Before that, I only listened to Spanish music and to Papiamento music. And uh, so I never had, any inclination to American pop, pop music. I don't know why, and it's still a little bit like that. But, but, but I still listen a lot to uh, Brazilian, African music, Cap Verdean. If you talk about those different music styles, can you connect that a little bit to the music on Curacao? Because that yes. also is a mix of different kinds of music, Yes, right? the, what speaks to me is uh, um, how everybody and actually, I hear the three of you talking about the same, how everybody mixes, mixes uh, their taste, what they grew up with, what they see, and you try to make it work, actually, and make something beautiful to bring people together. I, I was recognizing so much in all the things you were saying about why you design buildings, and I was like, that's why I write songs. I, I want to bring people together, too. And I am a product of everything I've listened to in my life, and I was always uh, touched by other people mixing. So um, Cap Verdean people, I heard the, the music from Cap Verde, yeah. I was hearing the Brazilian influences, the African influences, you hear the, the, the pop influences they have there, you know, and that speaks to me very much. Mm. And at some point I thought maybe I can do that with my own music. So mixing everything I learned in school, mixing everything I love, but keeping uh, the roots of my music, the, 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 the African roots, the Caribbean roots, keep that 
alive, but make it modern, make it fitting to me. And you, and you created a performance, The Island of My Father, where all these music styles came together. Yeah. But there was also a research into music as well. I did a, I did a research into, into the music and into my island. And we went with my father. Um, we went driving around. My father was um, an engineer. He was, a, he was at the, when the, the, the island started, started to build up. He was there and he built a lot of important um, uh, parts of, of the island. So he knows the island as no one else. Mm -hmm. So he started driving with us to show us around. But he was also telling us about his youth, about his story and his story and the Curacao story. It all came together. And so we had so much beautiful uh, stories to put together in a theater uh, play with music and and videos and stories, so um, it was a very important thing for me to be able to do with mm. my father. You are you are able to to touch people all over the world with your music, and, um, and let's keep it to the Netherlands. You can touch people in the Netherlands, and in the Netherlands, people seem to be so afraid for the changing. Mm -hmm. of their culture and if something always changes is is your culture but you are able with singing in papiamento to touch mm -hmm. the people in the netherlands why do you think they're still so afraid what what, what not everybody's what, what, afraid no there are people that are afraid but there are a lot of people that are open and are want embrace the change and i decided very early that i'm focusing focusing on them yeah. Because I think um, they will go and they will touch someone else, and that's the way you have to make the movement bigger. That's how I feel about it. And I, th you, I think you have you need you need the soft forces and you need the um, hard forces. You need the people that go and confront and and fight and and, and make a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. But you. But that's not my, um, my character, that's not my temperament. I am a storyteller, so I choose the soft part because you need that too. So I tell stories and I sing and I, don't, I just tell how, how it was, how it is. I, I tell about slavery, I tell stories about uh, Tula, the, the, the slave that tried to break um, the status quo in Curacao, and I just tell the stories, and people uh, are touched by the stories, and they go home and they think about it, and they go, oh, I never thought about it like that. To give an example, um, when I was a child, I, we, we, I was going to church, I was brought up uh, in the Catholic church, and I was sitting in the church, and I was like, why is everybody white on, on all, all the angels and all... And then after a few weeks, I heard a song that was called Angelitos Negros, in which someone asks, what happens to all the black people when they die? Don't they go to heaven? And I was like, you see, I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> and that made me think. And when I sing that song, I just, I just have to tell the story of I'm sitting in this church and I see that everyone is white and it can't be right. And I went to uh, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and there they were never colonized. Ethiopia has a black church. Mm -hmm. Jesus is black. Maria is black. Everybody's black. They look. They all look Ethiopian. So I was like, "See, th this is how it works." And I tell that story, and you don't have to say anything else because yeah. people understand. Hmm. There's, there's 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 something weird about this. You know, you don't have to say that's weird. You just tell the story, and that's the choice I made very early in my career because I have to stick to what I know mm. and that's telling stories. And that's, that's beautiful because you talk about a disconnection and a connection about it. I, I would like to broaden the conversation as well. Ali, can I ask you, um, is there anything that we can learn from music, from merging styles, emerging identities? And if we talk about identity, it goes beyond 
cultural identity. There's also the matter of gender, or there's also the matter of of, of, of sexual orientation, or or, or or literacy, or financial in the, uh, financial inequality. How can we define identity and use it in design? Oh gosh, that's a big question. Um, well, I mean, yeah, we, we we need to see it always from the point of view of the underrepresented. I think we need to always put ourselves in the position of someone who is not us uh, to kind of fully embrace where they're coming from, to fully embrace, uh, for example, you're dealing with a, particularly a mosque, for example, the role of women and how you can um, kind of question what those presumptions are and how, how you can um, put it in a positive way. So we did a project, um, I think in, in Doha, where for the, for the royal family and the head of the royal family, Sheikha Moza, was um, a very inspiring lady, a very kind of uh, very much uh, wanted to promote a positive agenda for women. But she said, "Well, why do women need to pray separately upstairs or in a, in a separate place? Why can't you just put them together on the same same area?" And because that's how it is in Mecca. So I think when you when you hear that kind of thing, you kind of start to question all those. Um, assumptions that are made um, and and how how you can challenge that and, and kind of break down the divide. And I think that that's kind of fundamental. I think m music and architecture, of course, they are very related. I mean, historically, it's, it's well acknowledged. Um, but um, I mean, I, I'm not really a, a specialist in, in, in that kind of area, but I, I would say um, for us, architecture is music because we, we're trying to make something which, which is accessible, which which people can read, um, which people can experience. I think that's the same joy that you have in in music, and, and it's quite inspiring, kind of, to hear the stories about songs and how 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 that kind of how the different disciplines. We're completely from different worlds, and different um, disciplines, as it were, but we always have we have the same story in the end. You know, mm -hmm. we're we're trying to do the same thing. Yeah. Right. I'm very interested in how you solved that uh, in the end. How did you solve the 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 the, the issue of of having share, having people sharing the meal together? And what was the reaction of the of society, so to speak? Was it successful in that sense? It was very successful because you just questioned. They just questioned based on 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 what the the ruling family said. People just just did it, and, and that was because it needed someone with authority. To say to, to say, listen, all those assumptions that you've made historically, they are inaccurate. They are based on, you know, um, a, a patriarchal interpretation. So mm. why don't we just um, lay it out how it really is? And I think that this is this is what we need to do because all religions, all faiths, there is a good in all of them. And I don't think that they they have set out to, to create problems uh, amongst gender, amongst uh, race, amongst you know, but. I think over time things have evolved. I mean, the interesting thing about the the the, the white Jesus, you know, Muhammad Ali did this really quite nice sketch about going to, going to heaven, and all he was asking his his mum, you know, are all the angels, you know, um, are all they all the angels white? Because you know this is what they're taught. So it's, I, yeah, it's it's quite interesting how how all this kind of comes together um, from different angles. Right, Anna. Uh, music in, in your life or musical icons, is there anything or anybody who you can refer to in regard to identity or architecture? Um, yeah, one artist I learned very much from is uh, jazz artist Sun Ra. Um, so he was a philosopher, poet, jazz artist. Um, and what he, so he, what he did was very interesting, I think. So he kind of created his own identity. He, he lived in, uh, in America and um, he, he was African-American, but he said, I'm from Saturn. I'm born on Saturn and I landed on planet Earth to, uh, to save you all. Um, and he didn't want to identify himself with the identity he was put upon, the identity of enslaved people, um, uh, people that are, yeah, Living under certain bad conditions because because they have uh, uh, because they're black, um, so he said, "No, I'm from uh, I'm from uh, black Egypt. I I come from a tradition that is ancient and where all this knowledge that is in the world is developed." And he 
uh, created his whole um, yeah, image language around that. Uh, but he also played a lot. So he actually he also dressed up like the god of sun. Um, and his whole uh, band uh, did. Um, but he also played a lot with words and gave it new meaning. So, for example, he said, uh, history is his story. You haven't heard my story yet. Mm. I am Mr. E. So he gave new meaning to words that we kind of take for granted or words that we yeah that that have that we learn that have a certain meaning um and, and it stands and and with with other people as well it's called afro futurism yes. Yes. where um the the story of the african culture has been adapted and alternative scenarios are being developed into creating new worlds that aren't there yet yes. but can be imagined yes exactly yeah. that imagination yeah. why is that imagination important because it's not just a fairy tale um, I think because you have to see that there are other possibilities. So if you don't imagine them, if you don't draw them, or if you don't sing them, <laughs> mm. then people won't... Uh, yeah, pe I think people can only identify with it if they actually see it. And it can kind of... Yeah, they can start uh, creating their own imagine imagination around them. And I, I also, in my family city, Mostad, I also try to implement his... Um, yeah, his method, Sun Ra's method, by also looking at what are a shared ancient traditions and rituals in this city that is now so segregated. So if we go back to this far past, mm -hmm. um, we could say that we all belong to this far past, that we are all the same uh, same mm -hmm. race, same people. Um, so what is what is there that connects people? So and in Mostad it was diving off of the old bridge, which men and women did uh, from the beginning. It was built in the 16th uh, century. Um, and I designed a monument that was dedicated to this diving and where you could learn to dive. But to test the idea, um, we gave workshops, or actually the, one of the, the champion divers of the city gave workshops to kids from different religious backgrounds in diving, but he also told them about the meaning of diving. And that was a very big success because these kids could kind of experience it with their own body, but also learn and, and have a shared experience. And actually this guy started his own diving school after these workshops. Mm. So that was like this monument I designed wasn't to be built. I didn't want it to be built, but I wanted to start an conversation and I think that this ima imagination is important because it can things can start developing from that yeah and, and it's the imagination that is important but also the shared history or the common culture that you can find and that can go back for centuries but it could be also recent and exactly that awareness of that common culture helps to bring people together like you did in the bridge as well yes right yeah. is there anything you would like to know Leongo? Yes, um, um, what, what I would like to know um, from you, Aina, um, uh, um, you, you mentioned uh, the, the, your experience of exclusion, and, and this has trans you have translated it in, in, in this strong desire to be inclusive. Can you, can you, can you tell us about that? How, how does that work? I mean, you have experienced what it is to be excluded, and, and, and how, does, how, do, how did that fire your, 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 your strong desire to be so inclusive in your designs? Um, well, I think that um, it, as a kid, because I experienced these, yeah, kind of really, um, yeah, a war, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it mm. otherwise. Uh, I was kind of, I didn't know how to deal with that part of my history. That's also, that's why I also read uh, this poetry of Sun Ra and it kind of helped me. Um, but it's really difficult to start dealing with it. So I was trying to find a language in which I could research my own past and experience. Um, and that was architecture. Um, and in a way, I think by doing all this research and by diving into it, I realized, yeah, but architecture is also very much a tool. Uh, so you could use it in a very wrong way in society, but you could also use it in a different way. Um, so, and I wanted to focus on uh, on that part, also to prove that that there are other ways to kind of to, to deal with each other in uh, society. I, I know you've tried also to bring this 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 concept of, of thinking inclu in, 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 in inclusion to, uh, to, to universities, to academies. Mm -hmm. And you have 
encountered some resistance in that? Um, uh, um, were you less of a singer, like uh, a storyteller, than, than Isaline, or, or what, what? What do you think happened there when you when you were trying to be inclusive? So, including the ones that were fighting you, you were also trying to include them. I, I, I suppose. Um. Yes. Um, yeah, what went wrong? A lot. I think I was a bit naive in the sense that I thought I could handle the problem. Can, um, you, can you give us a little bit of context? Because yes. you know about it, but yes. we don't. Yes. So, so tell, us, I, tell us a little I bit about it. I was appointed as head of the architecture department on the Rietveld Academy, the art academy. Um, I could, I, could, uh, I could start my own team of teachers, um, but there were also some other older teachers that had like a, a, a fixed contract mm. and all the new teachers had like a temporary contract and me as well. Um, well, and I wanted to connect the whole department to society. So everything we do, we do in relation to society. And I also wanted to have a team of teachers that um, that is a representation of Dutch society in cultural background, but also uh, male, female, age, in all different uh, ways. Um, and there was a lot of uh, resistance. And this resistance actually started at the moment uh, when teachers uh, came in that uh, didn't have a white uh, skin color. Um, and this resistance came, came from students, but also uh, teachers from uh, yeah just staff so that I think that was a, a big shock to me and I think I was too naive in that and maybe also because I'm white I didn't realize that this was such that this is still in th these days such a big big uh, issue um, and uh, yeah with this whole th with the whole theme we had actually we really wanted to deal with it and we were really open and we had a lot of meetings but we just didn't succeed and at the end I told the board of directors if you don't want to stand behind our team and all the teachers um, then we're just going to leave and uh, yeah they said uh, yeah we cannot promise you that we can uh, protect all of you so then we all said okay then we leave okay. and I, there I the wanted, story ended <laughs> I wanted, I wanted yeah. to ask Ali about education as well but first to you, uh, go to Iseline you're a teacher as well and you, mm -hmm. you, you teach at the uh, Amsterdam Drama, uh, Academy of Drama yeah. um, what is your experience in, in regard to uh, inclusiveness in, in, at the Academy of Theatre in Amsterdam now I know that they made a conscious decision at one point to diversify not only the student core but also the uh, the teachers and they really made big steps they changed the entrance exams for example because before you had to know total monologues, classical Greek uh, monologues and stuff like that. And of course, there would be people like you. I think you got in mm -hmm. and you finished the school. But yeah. so you did that. But they wanted... Well, I, I was before that. I, with, with, at my time, it was completely wide. But yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, so you got in yeah. by doing all the classical stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. But now they decided uh, they just go into the, in, in, in the neighborhoods. They find talented people. They changed the entrance exams so you could write your own monologue now and uh, and they they just I got, I got a chance to teach and I was really they called me to 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 come and um, so that was a it's a conscious decision to to do it to, to give that, an example to that uh, that it is possible at it an is art possible, academy to it, change the but student you have body. To, it, it's 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 a big thing yeah it, it, it changes mm. almost everything yeah Ali, can I can I ask you? Can we use education in order to change the perception of inclusion and to know that uh, inc inclusive design or inclusive society is for the better? Um, kids are not born with any prejudice. You know, they, they're taught prejudice. They're taught yeah. to, you know, um, tribal. I think that if you start with education from the very young age, you you, you, you can maybe make a change. But I think. These ideas, they're reinforced by media, by advertising, by all, all you see around you. You, you have this kind of automatic um, sense, I, I suppose, as a foreigner, that you know, you're not part of that, that, that group. I mean, those, these things are happening all the time. You just hear about Meghan Markle. And, but this is part of society. You know, this is how, how we've grown up. I think um, things are changing quite slowly. Um, 
people think they're doing the right thing, governments, uh, they're not really, you know, it's kind of window dressing as far as we're concerned. I think, um, yes, I mean, yeah, if you can really start with education. Uh, I mean, look, I, we did a workshop, we had a studio in Hong Kong for a while, and we taught um, a lot of the kids, architecture students, you know, how to make um, kind of mixed faith buildings. So we were interested in combining a Buddhist building with, I don't know, um, a church or, or not just faiths, but other things, other, other functions. And it was, really, it was really enlightening for us as well, because, you know, suddenly these kids are exposed to all kinds of different um, ideas. And, and we, we repeated the same exercise in, in the UK. So, and from that, we, we even had a workshop at the Tate Gallery in London. And it's really about um, getting kids at a very young age, even before they're even students of architecture, 16, 15, 14, uh, earlier if possible, and try to, try to make them think um, about different communities, about their needs, about how, how you can create spaces which are, which are I suppose, um, something they don't know about, they're not educated about. That, 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 that's how we, 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 we've tackled it in the past and it's been quite successful, I'd say. Well, uh, but, but we're reaching the final part of our conversation and the final part of the program as well. So I would like to look into the future. But again, you mentioned Meghan Markle and the reactions in society to her presence and her entering uh, the royal family. Here in the Netherlands last week, we had our elections and we saw that a uh, populist right extremist really got a lot of votes. Um, in that sense, in that regard, I'm very happy that your experience, experience with uh, children are very positive, but still I'm very, I'm looking to a bleak future where populism and right wing conservatism is still at the rise. So we can do whatever we want, but aiming for an inclusive society is, then that's my statement that you can react on, is an illusion. So we're, you know, heading far away from inclusion. So it's nice to have this conversation. It's not going to work. I think any government, any nation that is inclusive is stronger. So, if, I mean, if you look at America, America was falling apart when Donald Trump, let's say, was was preaching an idea of, you know, you are that, you are that, you are that, you know, you're, you know, I think it doesn't help. And, it, you know, the whole kind of American project or the idea of an American empire starts to be questioned. And I think that but people are not to... aware of that. And that's what I'm worried about. People are not aware of that. And even in Britain, people still don't understand what really the problem is in regard to Meghan Markle. And then she make it up and she's from America and she's an actress and she'll act anything. But they don't see the fundamental systemic problem that there is. So can people see that? And, and, and is it happening in the foreseeable future? People, um, I'd say, if you talk about white privilege, I mean, people find it an assault on, on themselves if you talk in that way. So you have to, I think it's how you engage with people because uh, automatically people are on the defensive. I mean, when we're talking about the Meghan Markle, Markle uh, context, um, people, the majority, let's say, um, they feel, um, you know, they, they shouldn't have to address that. You know, we've done a lot. The empire has done tremendous things for all these people in far off places, you know, and, and that's history. I think um, there is a kind of a, a revisionist um, idea that we don't need to think about it anymore. And it's enshrined in, pol in politics. So now, if you commit a rape, you go to jail for eight years. If you tear down a statue of a slave trader, which is what they've done in Bristol, you go for 10 years in prison. I mean, this is absolutely oh absurd you know, that, that we have laws which prevent people from expressing themselves you know, and, and they are so, I mean, it's... it's but in that possible. sense, the future is bleak. Then we can have a lot of programs here from Parkhouse Sveicher addressing inclusion. But as long as the system is like you describe, it's not, it's not going to happen. There's no use, is it? Maybe politicians need to understand they can, we can be stronger together. That, that's the basic message. And I think when a country understands that, utilise and harness the energy of the population, I think things can change. At the moment, we're at a funny moment, I think, in history. Mm -hmm. People are dividing and, and trying to get elected on the basis of division. Right. I do think the, 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 you can save it if all of us go and do our part with the people around us. I think it's, 
It's gonna take long, but it's gonna get better. I'm <laughs> it's sure. gonna get better. I, I hope sure. you're so right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anna, what is your position in the final part of our program? Is it gonna be a long, long and winding road? Or are you a bit more positive than I have been <laughs> in the past minutes? <laughs> um, I think both. In a, in a way, it reminds me of this populism, um, extreme right. It reminds me a lot of what has been happening in Yugoslavia and the way that that country uh, was torn apart and how the war started. And at the other hand, you see also, if you look at the youth, they mix a lot of cultures. They are very much open. They have a lot of communication. There's a lot of inputs through social media. Um, yeah, so, and, and there are some new political parties that are smaller, but that they, they have support. Um, mm. So I, I also see, I think education is the key. And I think education is also the, the part in life where kids start to be segregated at a certain point. And yeah. I think education really is, is the key because if mm -hmm. you stop segregating there, um, yeah, I think that would help a lot. Great. Leongo, can you please bring me a little bit of light in these dark times? It, it is, it, it's going to be a long road, and that's why I wanted to share the, the, the example of Arna with, uh, you know, what she encountered at, at, the, at, the, at the university. Um, it's going to be a long road, and I hope that this program is not like window dressing, that mm. the, the attention that we have for diversity and inclusiveness uh, this, this year or this past year, that is not something that will fade away. Um, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a long road for us that are propagating it. It's important to celebrate your, your small successes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and for the ones that, that, that need to, to change, so the, 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 the dominant culture if I might, might put it that way when they feel this 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 this, this, this stress of wanting wanting to, to 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 hold on then if they really believe that inclusivity is a necessity for us to survive that is the moment that they should reset and give space mm. and because from both sides it, it needs to come from both sides and 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 of course when you have when you feel you have to People think they're going to lose things, and in the end, you're only going to gain more. Uh, um, and and, and that, is, that is what you have to realize. So when you get that feeling of distress, then, you know, open up and see what, what the new thing is that is coming. Yeah. And as I think you're completely right. As soon as people do realize that nothing has been taken away, but things are just being added, that makes us stronger as a society, people will realize that it's, it's good to, to, to collaborate in that sense and to join forces. Um, we've almost come to the end of the program. Iselin, can I invite you to take your place on the stage? Of because course. we are going to listen to you, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, before, I would like to thank my guest. Is there any takeaway that's more most important for you for, from the program tonight? Well, I think the song that Iselin is going to sing is, is so fundamentally at the, at, at the right moment. I mean, I had to deal with the elections of Wednesday here and also with the elections of Friday in Curacao. Mm. And I don't know which one is worse. Mm. But um, um, the song that Iselina is going to sing is going to inspire me to, to leave this uh, place and, uh, and, and keep on fighting for what I believe in, and, and that is an inclusive society. Great. I would like to thank you. I thought I would like to thank our guests as well. Ali, thank you so much, and, and good luck in future. And I hope to see you here in, in the Netherlands soon, as soon as we are allowed to travel and allowed oh. to go abroad again. But thank you so much for sharing your stories and hope to, to see you here again. Again, thank you. And Anna, thank you as well. I wish you the best of luck with your projects. And uh, well, it's, it's great to have you here in the studio. So hopefully this is the first meeting of a series of meetings that we can, uh, can have in future. Um, I would like to take time to look forward to the next episode because on March 29th, uh, Francine Huben is going to be here, the famous architect, of course, and she's going to be joined by Aminata Cairo, Cairo and uh, the Ronald Snyders. And that's going to happen on the 29th of March, uh, where the human experience is central. Um, you created that program as well. Is there anything specifically that you're looking forward to, Leongo? 
I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the experience of uh, Francine abroad if, and, and also how does she bring that to the Netherlands if, if she has learned things that, that she was forced into abroad and, and, and maybe that is she's taking that with her here in the Netherlands. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really curious to know about that. Yeah, she's very internationally successful. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, she redesigned the, uh, the New York Library. Yes that we all know from The Wiz. Do you know that, that movie? Oh, the, I'll, I'll try to, to, to get a scene from that uh, from that movie uh, in next week's episode. Uh, Francine Huben's going to be here, and uh, Aminata Cairo, who is a great thinker, who spent time in uh, the United States and is back in the Netherlands as well, will we'll share her insights. And Surinamese composed, Dutch composer and musician, Ronald Snyder, who fuses all different kinds of music styles together, will talk to us. And he's got a civil engineering background as well, which is very interesting. I didn't know about it up until now. All right, make sure to watch the student book club meeting. That is tomorrow. And uh, the book Soft City that is here will be uh, discussed and it will be uh, moderate, moderated by Dimphy Brown. So that is tomorrow, but for more information, you can go to the Bakhuizenswerger website uh, slash DCFA, Designing Cities for All, and you can have more, find more information about that. Well, this has been it. We're going to listen at, uh, for, uh, as the final part of this program um, uh, to Iselin Kalista because we still have some way to go in, in, in architecture, in, in design, in creating inclusive cities. And let's end this episode with music and envision how this new architecture of Cities for All can look like, inspired by the musing of Iselin Kalista. História rico, pieda monde e vento e na mar. Da mi isla é tá interessante, com vista impactante e parte montanha. Na 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 na, e onda comita. Na 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 na. Mi país tun cusa de pobreza, atraco y maleza, y en de cutimbia tamolostia. Da mi isla y eta impresionante, un pueblo elegante y un barco no que tra. Na 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 na. E onda comida Me dá um tique preocupa Pra me parar em Camiluca Me não pôr mira bem futuro E me não saco um coslota Mas me dá essa vida de Deus Para ver se em quando Se é de um chance ajudando Te estrecha algum cos E cuida lo que Tá de nós Yeah Mijn navel 
streng begraven, daar keer ik steeds weer terug.